Hello and welcome to our program, A Syndemic of Mood Disorders, Medical Comorbidity and Sleep Disturbance, Navigating Assessment and Treatment Amidst the COVID Pandemic. I'm Roger McIntyre, psychiatrist in Toronto. Thank you for joining us. It's going to be an excellent two hours together. And it's an opportunity for us as colleagues to not just exchange information, but really, in fact, I hope meet what is the overarching aim of BCDF and the Braxia Institute, that's to close the gap, that is a gap between what we know as care providers and what we're actually implementing at the point of care. So a great welcome to all of you. We've got over 200 people joined us from across Canada and the United States. We've also got some folks joining us from Asia. So hello to all of you joining. Um, before we actually get the program underway, just a couple of introductory remarks if I could. You all in fact have before you um, <clears throat> your uh, interface. We have everybody for tonight's program on mute. If you have a question that you'd like to address throughout the program, we welcome it. We're using the question and answer feature. Do not submit your questions through the chat, only through the Q&A. And you'll have the opportunity to vote up in a very democratic way, questions that you really want to see answered by clicking on the thumbs up button. So if you see someone submit a question, hey, I love that question. You want to see it get to the top of the queue, push the thumbs up button. It'll push to the top of the queue. Let me quickly, if I can, introduce our faculty. You can see their names and their credentials. And uh, Dr. David Greenberg is going to introduce them all for you very shortly. But we have, in fact, program tonight that's going to be touching on topics of depression broadly and a bit more narrowly in treatment resistant depression, what we can do at point of care, what's novel, moving into a very, very commonly encountered scenario, that being depression in the context of pregnancy and postpartum, and also a discussion around insomnia and really integrating that into the larger picture of the depressed patient. We've broken the program down into sections. We're going to start off with depression. We're going to move into a discussion around novel, innovative approaches for treatment-resistant depression. Then we'll move into a discussion around pregnancy postpartum, and then we'll talk to the issue of insomnia. The theme throughout the evening is going to be around mood disorders and bringing it back to this most commonly encountered highly disabling condition. And we built in lots of time for questions. You, in fact, have the opportunity, of course, use some of this, uh, these hours as credits. Uh, that's there. I want to thank the sponsors for uh, over the years for their support in this program to make it all happen in uh, uh, these uh, education programs that we do put on, and also making you all aware of the fact that during these times where we're always looking for support, for patients, do not hesitate to reach out to these companies for more information or uh, opportunities uh, like I've used a lot, the experiencecontrary.ca program for patients who need access to weight loss treatment information and resources, especially during this time. So with that, I wanna just stop for a moment. I wanna ask David to come on board, to unmute yourself, David, if you haven't already. And I wanna, first of all, let everyone know David is a very good friend of mine. We have been uh, good friends for over two decades, shared many, many patients together over the years. And David is not only a family physician in Toronto, has extraordinary experience in the area of psychiatry broadly, certainly in mood disorders. And David's been working closely with me uh, now in our new initiative with Braxia, not just the Institute, but also what we're doing in novel treatments for depression. So David, welcome. Thank you. And thank you for those kind words. I'm honored to be part of this talk tonight or part of this um, this new program. Um, it's just really a great opportunity. And I just want to say that I'm, as an opening, that I'm relieved that there are many, many, many of our Canadian colleagues that think that their patient's mental health is more important than who wins between the Leafs and the Canadians. <laughs> so, so thank you for joining us. That one's been a long time coming. So obviously this is really much more important. Um, as far as the faculty goes tonight, um, I just want to say that they're, they all, they're extraordinary and they all have several things in common. First of all, they're lovely and smart and I've worked, either I've worked with them closely or been on boards with them or have just heard really great things about them. So this is a real, real treat and I think the next couple of hours are going to be extraordinarily insightful. So I'm really glad everybody was, is, is here. Um, just so you know, I'm going to be monitoring the Q&A and I'm going to be your voice. So um, if you do have questions and one popped up already, one from one of our very enthusiastic participants, 
Um, when we get to the end of each talk, we'll have a few minutes for a couple of questions, maybe three or four, depending on how detailed the answers are. And then when we get to the end of the evening, we'll have another 15 to 20 minutes to answer any um, questions that haven't been addressed. So thank you again, Roger, for the kind words and let's move forward. Let's move forward, David. I look forward to seeing the end of my presentation and I'll pass it over to you to introduce Josh. Let's get underway, folks. We're gonna talk about a pragmatic approach to the management, the diagnosis and management of a patient who has a mood disorder. These are disclosures of organizations that I work with in various capacities in the private and in the public sector. The first message is timely and accurate diagnosis. In 2021, most Canadians with depression are not diagnosed timely or accurate. Very simple fork in the road. Does my patient have major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder? Every patient with depression, you have to screen for bipolar disorder. If in fact the patient initially was diagnosed with depression, is not doing well with conventional treatment, revisit the screen for bipolar. I did a survey recently, 75 to 80% of American clinicians are aware of screening tools, but only 15 to 20% use them. Why the gap? They're fed up of too many false positives. We want screening tools that are brief, patient administered, sensitive, good negative predictive value. That is if the patient screens negative, they don't have the disorder. We also don't want false positives. This new screener is the rapid mood screener, free of charge, you can download it, doesn't cost anything. It has all the psychometrics you want in decreases to false positives that we've too often seen with screening tools in bipolar disorder. How do you arrive at this diagnosis at bipolar timely and accurately? Go back to 1970, Robinson Guse. How do you validate a mental disorder? You've really got to take that history, the age at onset. It's the 75-25 rule. 75% of all people with bipolar disorder start the illness before the age of 25. So early age at onset, high number of prior episodes, look at that pattern of comorbidity, not just drugs and alcohol, anxiety, ADHD and eating disorder, but also many of the well-known medical disorders like heart disease, diabetes, as well as obesity. Family history and obviously response to treatment for reasons we don't know, antidepressant medications are not reproducibly effective in people with bipolar depression. So when a patient says to you, I've had several antidepressant trials for my, in quotes, depression, and that trial is not successful, you've got to be suspicious about bipolarity. I often say that we're not really healthcare providers, we're actually lawyers in a courtroom, and we're trying to build the case beyond a reasonable doubt using circumstantial evidence. The other area I want you to think about is phenomenology. The adult who has bipolar disorder, when compared to the adult with major depression, is more likely to have atypical symptoms, the hyperphagia, hypersomnia, more likely to have psychosis. And I want you to remember the four A's. So when I see a patient with depression, I always ask myself the four A's. And that is, is the patient anxious, agitated, angry, and having problems paying attention? When a patient says to me, I'm depressed, Dr. McIntyre, I'm anxious as hell, I'm so agitated, I'm so irritable, and I think I got ADHD, that makes me very, very suspicious this person has bipolar disorder. So we've got to get this diagnosis made timely, make it accurately. If bipolar disorder is your working diagnosis, we go from the four A's to the three L's. Most people with bipolar disorder are utilizing healthcare services when they are depressed. Mania is a relatively brief excursion in the longitudinal course of the individual with bipolarity. Depression is polarity first. Depression is polarity predominant during the long-term course. The three L's are lithium, lamotrigine, lorazidone. When I see a patient refer to me, they say, Dr. Brown, I don't know why I'm even here. I've been on all the drugs. How can you help me? I say, have you been on the three L's? They go, what the heck is that? It's lithium, lamotrigine, lorazidone. Those are the first line treatments for bipolar depression alone or in combination. Mania is relatively straightforward. Second generation antipsychotics are the treatments of first choice. We also know that the majority of people will not sufficiently re uh, reach recovery with one of those three L's alone or in combination. And in some circumstances, we will add an antidepressant. 
Antidepressants have a relatively low liability to destabilize patients. The number needed to harm is around 150, but it's not infinity, so it could possibly happen. I would not prescribe an antidepressant to an adult with bipolar depression who has mixed or who has rapid cycling. What's the best long-term pharmacologic treatment for a person with bipolar? If it ain't broke, I don't usually fix it. In other words, what gets you well is what typically keeps you well. If in fact your patient has major depression, we know we have a uh, really a surfite of different pharmacologic and psychosocial and neurostimulatory treatments. It begins with what treatments are evidence-based, in some circumstances, health can or FDA approved, and thirdly, what's in CPGs, clinical practice guidelines. We have almost 200 guidelines for depression around the world. Here in Canada, we're familiar with CANMAT. In America, they have the APA and also the Florida guidelines. Most of these guidelines are really uh, similar with respect to their guiding principles, such as if it's a mild depression, you might not even need pharmacotherapy. Maybe a manualized based psychotherapy is a great place to start. What we all agree is once you have moderate to severe or greater, the invitation for antidepressant treatment as part of the regimen becomes in fact more calling. Where in fact there's also been a tectonic plate shift in the business is how long should we wait before we optimize antidepressant treatment in an individual patient? When I started in this business, it was six to eight weeks. David, remember those days? I think you probably remember them well. Now it's two to four weeks, we're not waiting. If the light's not flickering in two to four weeks, it's time to dial up the dose. How long do you stay on treatment for? Well, it's a bit like asking how long is a piece of string? It's gonna depend on each individual circumstance, but a heavy dose of common sense is at play here. If your patient has risk factors for relapse recurrence, it is indeed time for us to stay on treatment longer. Now, I'm not gonna go through all the antidepressants. David and I have chatted about this a lot. I think most of us know the names. This is what I would call a very pragmatic approach. When we have antidepressants, most patients don't say, please put weight on me. They don't usually say that. They don't usually want sexual dysfunction and they don't wanna be emotionally blunted. So these are already filters that are in place. And 10 years ago, we didn't have some of these options like 40 oxytine, velazodone, levomil, nasoprint. But what you can also see is some just very pragmatic considerations. Does the patient have a lot of anxiety? Does that guide you? Not particularly, maybe bupropion doesn't quite make the cut in that case, but we have many others to choose from. In the context of pain, I'm always thinking about an SNRI first, maybe also uh, the uh, agent levomilnasopram, which is really not an, uh, an SNRI, it's more of an NSRI. What about cognition? Well, we all think about 40 oxytine, that would be one of my first choice, but I wouldn't rule out an SNRI as a second line approach Comorbidity depends on what it is. Is it panic? Is it socialized? Is it generalized anxiety? SSRIs come to mind, maybe an SNRI. Fatigue, we think about more adrenergic drugs. Despite how pragmatic and intuitive this is, this has no evidence spatially to support it other than cognition and 40 oxytine. In other words, we don't really have good, good baseline predictors of who's going to respond to which particular treatment, even when it's intuitive. In other words, a fatigue patient is not more likely to respond to an anti-fatiguing drug, but we do have some anti-fatiguing antidepressants. And that's one way to consider it. In my clinical experience uh, over the years, probably one of the best baseline predictors of response to antidepressants is a history of trauma. In fact, if you have an, uh, a history of ACE, adverse childhood experiences, which affects between 30 to 65% of people with depression, you see a significant attenuation of response and remission rates. There's lots of evidence now in animal models and in human models that are converging around a story around biophenotyping. And in the context of trauma and depression, the biology and the phenomenology are slightly different than people who have depression and no trauma. For example, on the phenomenologic end, we see more anhedonia more blunting that manifests as feeling numbed and disconnected as well as cognitive impairment. Below the surface, we see a variety of changes, including but not limited to 
a increase in what's called the pro-inflammatory balance, a biosignature of inflammation, which we now think attenuates responses to conventional SSRI treatment. Where do we go from here? Well, this is the classic Yogi Berra fork in the road. When you get to it, you take it. We really don't have really a large evidence base to really hold our hand beyond first line treatments. What we all know from clinical experience and from the research is that you get really a couple of uh, you know, attempts at the bat here. Your chance of getting a home run that is remission and full syndromal recovery with that first antidepressant comes in around 25 to 30% on a good day. Similar percentage with that second intervention, maybe around 25 to 30% on a very good day. It's probably lower. Taken together, the window of opportunity drops off very quickly. In other words, the remission rate with the third monoamine-based antidepressant drops down to about 10 to 15%. So lots we can say about that, but going back to the point earlier about trauma, out of the gate, these patients who have comorbidity, who have trauma, multiple episodes, long illness duration, they need integrated evidence-based psychotherapy with pharmacotherapy out of the gate. When in fact, these patients are not achieving the objective after say the first treatment, we start thinking about combining antidepressants or switching. Uh, in Canada, it's very common for clinicians to add antidepressants like bupropion or mirtazapine to the index agent, despite the fact that the evidence base for that is somewhat modest, if you will, in its rigor. The best evidence we have right now in adding agents together is with second generation agents like aripiprazole, quetiapine, brexpiprazole. The liability, however, of these agents is in some cases weight gain for quetiapine, sedation, somnolence can be an issue. Brexpiprazole has lower akathisia than aripiprazole, but we still see it. And we're not out of the woods with respect to tardive dyskinesia. Meta-analytic evidence indicates that with long-term exposure to SGA, second-generation antipsychotics, the TD prevalence is about 7 to 8%. Not 100%, but not zero, something we still need to consider. Now, I'm always asked about the role of anti-inflammatories, stimulants, uh, uh, you know, uh, drugs that target the metabolic system. And we'll get into this maybe a bit later on in the evening. But already, I've covered where the evidence takes us. So we define treatment-resistant depression in mood disorders as suboptimal outcome with two interventions. Why two? Because the chances of the third one working, if you stick with the same old game plan, is about 10% at best. That's why we have this so-called face and rush criteria. And out of the gate, we've got a long uh, playlist, if you will, to choose from. I would encourage you when you're switching antidepressants as your second or third line strategy, please switch out of class. When in fact patients are not mounting an optimal response, then we begin to add things on. And that could include atypical, but very often includes an antidepressant and not infrequently will include, will include stimulants. In 2021, the question is not interesting or relevant anymore. What's more effective, pharmacotherapy or psychotherapy and depression? They're both effective. The more interesting question is, does psychotherapy work in treatment-resistant depression, yes or no? The answer is we have no evidence of that, but it works in combination with pharmacotherapy. A lot of patients come to see us and they say, I've tried all your medications, they don't work. I wanna take a break and just do psychotherapy. That's not what they should do. They should combine psychotherapy with some other treatment. A related question is, which treatment works better for which symptoms? This is a wonderful itemized analysis published in World Psychiatry, where the investigators found something which if they didn't find this, I wouldn't have believed it. What they found is what I do believe, is that pharmacotherapy for depression is better at treating reward symptoms like fatigue, anhedonia, as well as in fact, the anticipation of pleasure. It's also better for cognitive symptoms like impulsivity, uh, focus and concentration, and in the short-term suicidality. This is why we need to integrate in a patient, both the pharmacotherapy and the psychotherapy because pharmacotherapy has a differential efficacy across very specific symptoms 
and complements what we're seeing with pharmacotherapy. It has been an extraordinarily interesting time in the area of drug discovery or treatment discovery in psychiatry. And as clinicians, we're always being experimental. There has been innovation stasis for quite some time, but now we've got some exciting lines of sight. And I won't go through all of these, but just wanna to touch on a couple of these points. We've had an intoxication with the monoamines going back to the discovery of amipramine in 1955. Only in the last two years, we've built street light is now shining on glutamate. And glutamate is a drop down menu with many different drugs being studied. Of course, ketamine and S ketamine, we're going to hear about shortly, but there's many others. For example, people are looking at uh, dextromethorphan. In fact, later on this year in the United States, dextromethorphan, good old DM, the anti tussif discovered by the CIA as an alternative to codeine for army uh, enrollees. This has now been, in fact, uh, developed as an antidepressant. It behaves like ketamine in the brain. We also have this isomer of methadone that doesn't have addictive properties, uh, dextromethadone being developed as an antidepressant. So the academia around depression, specifically sussing out these targets, is furnishing for our patients hope, hope that they're not held just ransom to one SSRI after the other. We have some genuinely novel ways that we're going to be taking patients in the future. And glutamate targeting is not just an opportunity for hope and treatment resistance and in cases of a chronic depression, but may also offer rapidity of action within one to two days, as well as anti-suicide properties. The tool shortly is gonna walk us through the whole topic of orexins. This is a really interesting area, orexin receptor antagonists, singles and duals. And we've been especially interested in looking at the role of orexin receptor antagonists. We now have one in Canada, Davigo, as an antidepressant, as a pro-hedonistic drug as a pro-cognitive drug. And a number of years ago, I said to myself, I got so fed up of giving people treatments that just don't work well enough for them. I said, we gotta do things differently and we've gotta really help their cognition and we've gotta help their reward. And where glutamate's really exciting, as well as some of the other targets I alluded to, like the dextromethadone, including orexins, is they're also helping us in the area of reward. Patients don't say, I have a problem with reward. They say, I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I have no motivation, no joie de vivre. And this critically influences patient reported outcome. And this is another reason why we're very excited about those targets. Neurostimulation, ECT, TMS, work in treatment resistant depression. ECT is really the, the heavyweight champion of the world when it comes to efficacy, doesn't do too well in public relations, thanks to Jack Nicholson. We have some alternatives uh, that are out there. This is an example of an alternative transcranial direct, but it's getting really nifty, some of the new ways that neurostimulation is being given. And we look forward, in fact, seeing where that takes us, but it represents yet another opportunity for patients that we see. So taken together, let's get the diagnosis timely and accurate. Let's get people on the right treatment course from the get-go using complementary pharmacology and psychosocial treatments. And it's been so exciting to see the innovation that's in front of us. David, the floor is over to you. Thank you so, so much. That was unbelievably comprehensive. And I'm happy to say, and I'll say it again later, I don't think Roger ever opens his mouth without me learning something. And not just learning something, but something that actually changes the way I practice, which is, you know, um, when it comes to medicine, um, transfer, knowledge transfer isn't the key. Behavioral change is the key. And the fact that I changed my behavior on what I learned from him is quite remarkable. And the concept of people failing on, um, on antidepressants who then turn out to be bipolar is something that I've only learned from him in the last few months and has probably saved four, of my, four or five of my patients' lives so far. So just so that's been a really, really valuable uh, learning. And this new screener is obviously going to be a very, very, very helpful uh, a very, very helpful tool. Um, there are a few questions here. Um, so just one of the, these are interesting, actually. Um, I think the, there's a question that was voted on by 
that was sort of upvoted by several people. It has to do with how to get people into a ketamine clinic. I think we're going to leave that one till the end tonight, because I think that's going to be a question that's going to be coming up through the course of the evening. And, um, and Roger and Josh perhaps are going, to, are going to be able to give that a more fulsome answer. Um, there's a question about pharmacogenomic testing for mental health conditions. That was a really, really, really big deal about four or five years ago, and then sort of stopped. So, because um, my understanding was that it turned out to not be particularly helpful. What, do you, what, do, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think when it comes to pharmacogenomics, what I would say is I don't use them, full stop. Then what I would say is, is that pharmacogenomics has been guilty of what's called the hype curve. So the height curve refers to this incredible exuberance out of the gate, followed by tremendous disappointment. I hope I'm not describing anyone's romantic relationships, by the way, but <laughs> tremendous disappointment. And then there's this sort of plateau of enlightenment. And what I'm saying is, is out of the gate, there's so much exuberance that the exuberance trumps the evidence. It is my firm belief that we will get there to a point where genetic testing, maybe with some other testing, will be point of care. But today, 2021 in May, I don't use it. It hasn't shown to be cost-effective and predictably improving health outcomes in people with depression. That's great. This next question, which just got voted up, and I'm grateful for that because Roger and I have spoken about this about patients, not just um, academically, because it has to do with clarifying optimal treatment for adolescents. Now, the ages that they suggested were 17, 18, 19, my problem has been up to 18 because they're pediatrics and I'm only allowed to prescribe fluoxetine at this point, which right. I know for some of them is not the right drug. Um, how do we get around that? Good question. I'll keep it brief. And what I would say is, is that we're all aware of the black box warning around suicidality. It appeared circa 2004. NIH sponsored results in adolescent depression indicate unequivocally that the combination of fluoxetine or sertraline with a psychosocial intervention gives better outcome than either modality alone. If you see a patient who has adolescent depression, I would in fact strongly encourage screening for bipolarity in that particular situation. If bipolarity has been confidently ruled sort of down for the moment and you think it's major depression, uh, psychosocial interventions, the foundation, and in some cases, I would consider an antidepressant. Let's not forget that lorazodone is approved for adolescent bipolar depression, which is a very dangerous uh, condition and needs to be treated very, very aggressively. So we do have some role for antidepressants, but I do see psychosocial intervention as the bedrock there. And of course, the challenge is um, for some of the newer antidepressants, we're not a, you know, it's, it's off label, off college to be able to prescribe those, even though they're probably safer and more effective than, than fluoxetine and sertraline and more appropriate for some of these kids. That's right. That's right. So maybe we'll have more time at the end, David, for more questions. Sure. We'll okay. So I think, yeah, so I think we should move on. Um, the questions are still there and I promise you that they'll be gotten to before the, before we get to the end.